Hey everyone, I'm Danny, uh, this is Jack. And uh, so just to give you an overview of kind of what we're talking about today, uh, we're gonna start with giving uh, kind of a general overview of streaming uh, and uh, some of the challenges associated with that. Uh, that should be pretty quick. Uh, then we'll spend kind of the bulk of the presentation talking about uh, Go specific features that enable streaming pipelines. And most of those have been added in the last couple of releases. Uh, and then finally, Jack will walk us through an example, of kind of putting it all together. Um, so first of all, kind of our, our lightning overview of why streaming is hard, uh, especially compared to batch. Uh, so traditionally, uh, we kind of have data sets that look like this. Uh, they're potentially huge, but bounded, and uh, you know when they're going to end. Uh, and we want to go to something that looks more like this, uh, where we've got an unbounded set of data that uh, might not have a well-defined end, and might, you might not even really know uh, where it starts either. Um, so this sort of data might be delayed or incomplete uh, if there's network challenges or uh, if your data source just hasn't gotten you the data yet. Uh, you could have rate limits or the data might not be all available yet. Um, and of course, it can be conceptually infinite. Uh, and with that, you might need to do some sort of aggregation. Uh, so. You might need to emit 10 minutes worth of data, uh, and you need to figure out how you can handle late data uh, along with that. So what happens if data comes in at the 11th minute? Um, you might need to wait for your data source if you're getting throttled or there's just not data available. Um, and you might need to handle like draining and uh, updating your pipeline during execution if there's a bug or uh, you just want to add some functionality. So this talk isn't going to talk through how to handle all of these problems, but it's going to focus on how to write a robust streaming source so you have all of the information that you need to handle things uh, kind of further along the pipeline. We won't get into things like triggering strategies and some of those things that are interesting and important, um, but we'll focus on how to write a full streaming source. Um, so with that said, Jack's going to talk about splittable do funds. Yeah, so uh, splittable do funds, are uh, an important concept in Beam as a whole for your scaling, but in streaming, they uh, are paramount for how you operate on streaming data. So you want to scale up your processing, right? You have a lot of operations. Some of them may be long running. You may have a lot of data to process. You would like to be able to scale up to multiple workers across different machines on any run you're using. And so this is how you do that. You want to be able to scale your pipeline execution to a number of workers, improve your throughput, uh, handle your big problems with lots of resources when you need them. You want to distribute these things that are parallelizable, parallelizable, tough word. And you want to make sure that the advantage of Beam, which is that you're operating on embarrassingly parallel data problems, you want to make sure you're leveraging that. So there are a couple of requirements that we're going to walk through for splittable do funds. Uh, they can look very verbose on a page, but when you break them down and split them up, they're much easier to understand. You need a restriction tracker, you need, which is some way to represent your data that you're processing. You need a couple extra methods that deal with that. And then you need to accept and use a restriction tracker in the process element function of your structural do fund. So, uh, what this sort of looks like is we have some splittable do fund type here. We're going to create an initial restriction. This is for sort of a generic file IO where you would get the length of the file and then represent it as a length from start to end. That is an offset range restriction that's built into the Go SDK. And then you also want to be able to create your uh, R tracker using that restriction, using the create tracker function. And then you're really wrapping that with some functionality and a mutex because you're dealing with con concurrency. And the last thing you want to do is create a race condition while you're processing all of your precious data. And then the last sort of key element of this is you accept the lock R tracker in your process element function. And so you're doing your work, you're opening your file, and then the important elements here are you are using that restriction tracker to try to claim work to process. So this is effectively how multiple workers coordinate what work is or isn't done. 
your re restriction tracker has a try claim function. You give some position in the restriction you want to operate on. It just returns a Boolean saying, yes, that is available, process it, or no, that's already been done, don't. And in this case, if you can claim it, you would get your record, read it, omit it, and advance your restriction tracker to the next record. If not, you're done processing. You return nil, and you're done to go. You're ready to go. And then uh, this mechanically is split by the runner. So the runner can signal to the worker that it's detected long-running data, that it's a big process, and you want to split and distribute uh, to another worker or reschedule it for later, what have you. So this splits into two pieces, a primary piece that the current worker will continue working on and a residual that gets rescheduled. That terminology will be a little important later, we'll get there. But this is how runner side splits work and how splittable do funds work at their core is the runner dynamically rebalances by calling a split function on the restriction. Uh, and that's how that goes. And then process continuation is another concept that we need strictly for streaming. Because we've talked about how if the runner recognizes we need to split, but what if we want to split for some reason? What if we say, okay, now's not the time to process this data. Let's do that later. So in streaming workloads, that means we're waiting on new data or we keep querying our service and they're, they're throttling us because we're taking up too much bandwidth. What do we do? Well, we deal with process continuations in the B model. So we can return that as a returned value from our do fund. There are two kinds. There's a resuming and a stopping process continuation. This is similar to how uh, Java implements this. Um, you can resume your uh, bundle processing by returning a resuming continuation. You say, hey, we're going to reschedule this later. Here's, you can even suggest a time at which the runner should reschedule these things. Uh, Runners don't have to respect this at all, and many don't seem to consistently, but it's nice. You can set different timeouts if you're waiting on data or getting throttled. Those are two different situations you may want to wait longer. Or say you've detected an error, or you just have a case where you want to stop processing. You've ingested all the data you want. You can return a stopping continuation. This just exits your do fund. Everything cleans up, and the worker and runner just keep going. You don't have to do anything else. So that's sort of what this looks like here. Uh, once again, fictional IO, so uh, we're not doing a lot of things here. But we do the same thing we were doing where we're trying to claim our work with our restriction tracker, but the major difference is being we are returning a process continuation. So we have a, a sort of a naked for loop, which if you're not familiar with Go, that's the equivalent of a while loop. So we're just sort of iterating through, trying to get records. If we run into an error retrieving our records, if it's a throttling error, we're going to resume processing later. If it's some generic error, we are just going to stop, throw it out. And then otherwise, we fall back into our usual try and claim our work, iterate on our position, emit our records. But if we can't claim any work, we're out of work to do, another worker's done it, we can stop, shut down, and keep going. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about watermark estimation. Uh, so, well, you might not expect this if you've been around uh, the conference, but uh, traditionally we kind of expect that our event time and our processing time are essentially the same. So uh, element comes in and we immediately process it. But in reality, it looks more like this. Um, so there's some variable lag between the time an event comes in and we process it. Um, so that kind of begs the question, how do we know it's safe to finish a Windows work? Uh, so if we're trying to emit data that represents uh, 10 minutes of event time, how do we know uh, that we've actually processed all of the data for that 10 minute window? And Beam's answer is watermarks. Um, so at a high level, watermarks are Beam's notion of when data is complete. Uh, so it's basically just a timestamp. Um, and once a watermark passes the end of a window, uh, so in this case, uh, once the watermark hits that, that 10 minute mark, uh, additional data for that window is considered late. Um, and 
Beamgo has several built-in watermark estimators, and I'll walk through a couple of them um, so you can get a sense of how you might choose a, a given watermark estimator um, and when it makes sense to write your own and kind of how you would go about doing that as well. Um, so the first one I'm going to talk about is timestamp observing watermark estimation. Um, so looking at this graph, we're going to see elements from bottom to top because that's processing time. That's uh, how the machines will encounter it. Um, so the way timestamp observing watermark estimation works is when you encounter an element, you just instantly set the watermark to that element's event time uh, once you emit it. So in this case, we encounter that first element uh, and we set the watermark to its event time. Uh, we then continue on uh, and we encounter a second element. Uh, watermark should always be monotonically increasing because if a watermark goes backwards, uh, data that was at one point considered late would be no longer considered late. Um, so because this has an event time that is less than the watermark, we don't do anything to the watermark and it stays the same. Uh, when we move on to this third element, however, because it has an event time that is greater than the watermark, we're going to go ahead and advance the watermark. Um, so at this point, uh, you can see the watermark kind of jumps to that element. Uh, when we encounter this fourth element, again, it has an event time that is greater than the current watermark. And so we advance the watermark. Um, with our fifth element, because it has an event time that is less than the watermark, we do nothing. Um, and this continues um, kind of on through all of the elements until we reach this last 10th element. And um, in theory, it's a streaming pipeline. You probably have more data than it's 10, but uh, it just kind of continues on. Um, so what does this actually mean? Uh, you can see this watermark has advanced over time. Um, and basically what this means is that any data that is processed, um, that when it is processed has an event time that is less than the watermark is considered potentially late. Um, I say potentially late because some of it depends on exactly how the window falls. Um, if its window hasn't closed uh, by the time the piece of data is uh, processed, then um, it won't be considered late because it doesn't get you anything at that point. But in general, you can kind of think of it as uh, there is a chance that any piece of data uh, that has an event time less than the watermark may be considered late. Um, so moving on to another example. Uh, Real-time watermark estimation is much simpler. Uh, it just sets the watermark to the current processing time. Um, so this basically assumes that there is no lag between the event time and the processing time. Um, and this means that any data that comes in and has any lag could be considered late. Um, the last built-in watermark estimator in BeamGo is uh, manual watermark estimation. And it's basically just the choose your own adventure path. Um, so you can imagine something like this. Uh, this would be an example of a good watermark if you're trying to have no late data. Um, but that might not be the best watermark in every situation. Um, you might prefer something like this, which has some late data, um, but because the watermark advances faster, uh, you can close your windows faster and emit data faster. Um, so basically, there's always going to be this trade-off in how you define your watermark between the completeness of the data and uh, how quickly you uh, want to emit results. Um, and you can kind of tailor this to whatever the needs of your application are. Um, but in general, you're always going to have that trade-off. Um, so using a watermark estimator in Beam is relatively straightforward. Uh, the biggest thing that you need to do if you're implementing a custom one is you need to uh, create a struct with this current watermark function. Um, and that can return some watermark of your choosing. You can optionally uh, include an observe timestamp function that'll be called every time an, an element is emitted. Um, and it will just uh, run your function with the timestamp of that emitted element. Um, using it, uh, again, like you don't need all of this. Uh, you can just uh, add a create watermark estimator function to your, your do fund. Um, and that will add a watermark estimator. Um, if you want, you can also include these two stateful functions if you want to maintain state, um, which most watermark estimators are going to need some sort of state uh, between runs. Um, and you can also pass your watermark estimator into your process element function if you want to have some sort of custom logic that um, you know, depends on the, the elements that you're reading. Um, so the last topic I'm going to talk about here before we 
uh, moving to a, an example is bundle finalization. Um, so bundle finalization is not technically uh, strictly a streaming concept. Um, it can be used in batch scenarios as well. Um, but kind of the canonical motivating example is you have some sort of message queue um, that you want to acknowledge the messages for, but only after you're certain that the data is going to be persisted and there won't be kind of a failure in your DuFont execution or a failure in uh, networking somewhere along the way. Um, and what this lets you do is it lets you register callbacks once a runner has durably persisted the output of a bundle. Um, and a bundle here, uh, if you're not familiar, is uh, basically just one or more messages um, for, for our purposes, that's, that's enough here. Um, so this is useful for acknowledging messages. You can use the uh, state that you've stored in the do fun. Um, and um, it's basically just best effort, so it's going to happen at most once, um, and we won't retry it. Um, so using it is really straightforward. You just need to pass in a bundle finalizer to your function, and then you can register a callback like this. Um, it has an expiration, so in this case, it's five, five minutes. Um, if it doesn't get called within that time, then the callback will just be ignored, but you can also set that to an arbitrarily large value if you don't want to have uh, a timeout. Um, so now Jack's going to talk about kind of putting all of these concepts together. Yeah. So the, the t example we're going to walk through is an example of a very simple native PubSub IO in Go. Because uh, Go has cross-language PubSub IO. Cross-language is a great feature of Beam for adding uh, Java's transforms, Python's transforms into Go. But what if I don't want to use Java? Let's, let's use some Go. We're, we're Go people. It's great. So what does that look like? Uh, and this is going to be using an example that is currently in the Beam repo. Uh, the Go SDK's examples directory has a folder called native word cap. All of this code is there. This is somewhat edited and abbreviated for clarity, but if it's there, you can play with it. You can improve it. I'll gladly review any PRs if people want to play with it. Cool. So our uh, R tracker, we're going to be very simple. We're just going to keep up with what subscription we're going to be reading from. And we're going to have a Boolean called done, just if we're done. Uh, try claim is simple. We're just going to make sure that you're trying to claim work from the same subscription. We're not going to do uh, too much with it because we're only doing one subscription. And then the split function I talked about earlier that I didn't give much of an example of, uh, we have to provide. And so how it operates is it tries to split at a fraction of the known estimated work left for your restriction. In this case, we're doing a streaming setup. We're going one subscription, and we're not really too worried about a runner side split. So we're going to have very, very simple logic. If we are splitting at fraction 0.0, .0 which is a checkpoint, we're trying to move all of our remaining work to a residual, then we'll bump our subscription over. We'll mark the current uh, restriction as done just to make all the checkpointing safeguards happy to make sure we're not losing any data. And then we'll return everything as needed. Otherwise, it's a no op. We're going to ignore the runner. I don't care about what the runner wants to do right now in this example. And then our process element, there are a couple parts of this that we're going to talk about. Uh, so this is our actual message reading loop. Uh, PubSub is a little uh, funky in that the only way to actually read messages is by providing a channel for it to send things across. So we had to do a little bit of work to deal with that. So we have our select case wrapped in our uh, for loop. We are making sure we're getting messages, we're processing them. When we emit them, I've been told this is an important thing to emphasize, we emit them with their publishing time as an event time. When you build streaming pipelines, you have to provide windows for your pipeline to consistently fire, or else you're going to have your I.O. start, and then you're going to be reading data, and you're never going to have an end of window happen, and the rest of your pipeline doesn't happen. And that's not fun, and it happens a lot because people forget about these things. So we emit with an event time, and then we set up a little timer to make sure that we're getting messages every five seconds or so. If not, we can schedule a resumption later. That's sort of what the bottom case is there. 
And then for our uh, callback registration, we actually keep up with all the messages we get from PubSub. And then once they've been durably persisted into the pipeline, we go through, acknowledge them, clear out all of our uh, references for garbage collection purposes, and then return. Pretty straightforward. And that's how all that works uh, vaguely. Like I said, all of that code is available on GitHub right now. You can run it on Dataflow. Um, I'm also happy to answer any questions about that uh, code if you want to poke around at it later. But uh, are there any questions for myself or Danny now? <laughs>